I wanted to first start by sharing most recent experiences of uh, rain or rainfall. In recent uh, days, we've had uh, a number of rainfall cases. Uh, and most of us have experienced that, and I wanted us to share to see the uh, following video. So this is a short video just to share a recap of uh, experiences with rainfall. So with that recap of experiences, the challenges that we feel, we feel with the excess rainfall. So I thought uh, this is more like a summary, like a reminder of cases before and after the concept of rainwater harvesting management with regard to trying to re recover the natural water system. So. This is more for compilation, what role rainwater harvesting management can play when we talk of uh, trying to address these uh, challenges of uh, excess rainfall that you are experiencing all over there. The places locally in Tanzania, but also globally as well. So we see that there's a role that uh, I, me, you can play individually. At a decentralized manner, but also there are roles at community level, which we have all together have an input and contribution at impacting, uh, impacting effecting the role working against the challenges which we are facing now, which are mostly yeah. as a result of cases of organization and that anthropogenics as well. So in summary, in short, we are all welcome to consider rainwater harvesting for sustainable management. With that short brief, I would like to introduce my colleague, Nijunia Han. To come and continue the presentation. We are both organizations interested in. Uh, we're both organizations interested in promoting rainwater harvesting as uh, an essential source of the sources that we have at our disposal in the world. Not only groundwater, not only serve the water, but initially everything is on the rainwater. And that is what we would like to uh, emphasize. Now we are underusing that to a large extent. We are not taking action to actually make that work for us people. And as uh, Tuli was just showing, by not doing things, we're causing problems in places like Dar es Salaam. Uh, when the rains are a bit more than we are used to. As you can see from this screen, we work basically everywhere. I know the race global, IRA is global. We're trying to promote these issues everywhere. This one. Now, did people bother? Yes, people always bothered about water. People always bothered about water and they managed to get to deal with the water droughts, with the scarcity of water that they face. As you can see in these pictures here, now Northern Africa, Southern Africa, we have on a regular basis serious problems and the problems are becoming even worse. Of course, the rain belt in the middle, as you can see the yellowish and green parts, they're usually doing well. Now those who are, of course, living in Tanzania, see that you know, Tanzania only is not half is good for rain, the other half is a little bit difficult for rain. Does that matter? Not that much. Even when you have five, six hundred millimeter of rainfall a year, when you're prepared, you can collect an awful lot. But one thing you have to do is you have to make sure that you're ready. Because in many instances, when the rain is falling on hardened soil, it just runs off. It's not able to penetrate the soil and therefore it's a lost opportunity. And you get this type of picture. 
where people are just collecting water from the very, very far away, which is causing problems because they spend so much time and energy collecting water. No time to go to school. Less water for hygiene, so less health. And then again, also in our societies, we have ever more old people and people who are chronically ill who cannot always take care of themselves. So what if they have to get water from far? It's difficult. Rainwater harvesting is not the ultimate solution, but it is certainly something that prepares you as a person, as a household, as a community, as a village, as a town. It prepares you for the future, for a future where there will be less water or sometimes too much. Now, normally when we talk about it, we we talk about rainwater because of agriculture. You can see it here. Uh, synergy with agriculture, agrophilia, and basic ecosystem quality and productivity. That's what we usually think about. And increasingly, because of climate change, the fact that the water is running off our hills and our fields, we have to do more in water shed restoration and improvement in order to slow down the runoff. What mitigate flooding so that we have less disasters. And then, of course, in many parts of the world, we are not going to be able to supply centralized or decentralized borehole based, well based water supplies. And so, therefore, we also have to look at rainwater harvesting for domestic water supply. Lastly, when we do it well in our towns, we will be able to improve the urban water management. There will be more water for the town, for the households. And we will also be able to do more urban agriculture. Don't say that urban agriculture is not important. When I was looking for my hotel this, this morning, I saw lots of spaces where people can grow a few tomatoes, some vegetables. And I know many towns in Africa where this is a regular thing. So, Water, rainwater is important. Unfortunately, water stress is there for everybody because we have so many, we have compressed everything. The urban development is not always you know, up to scratch. And then again, water rainfall has become less regular. The people in this area, when I was talking to some of my friends yesterday, they said, no, 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 no. December. The water, the, fall, the rainfall has to stop. It has not stopped. It is still coming. So what we find is irregular rainfall. Dry seasons are longer. Wet seasons, wet periods start later. Does it matter? Yes. But if we have storage, we can overcome the eggs. So therefore, that is something that we need to think about. And it's a combination of what I write here, traditional engineering. As good engineers, we think of all kinds of things from a technocratic perspective. That is good, but not good enough. We have to do this all together with the people and work together on conservation, on storing, on retaining water. Three R, retention, storage, recharge, infiltrated and then we use it later so that is there for us to be able to use it can that be done oh yes here are examples from uh, malawi i just saw that some people from malawi are also tuned into this uh, program uh, rainwater harvesting for agriculture there are so many ways by which you can do it collecting in ponds harpoons of course deep bed farming is there uh, i noted that one of the speakers later on is also a board member of BIGIT, an organization that is regreening the earth. And so there are ways by which you can uh, increase your income by raising resilience. The farmers who are using this deep end farming are claiming that they have doubled the produce when using this deep end, deep end farm. So it makes a difference if you have rainwater for properly. Also, taking challenge and we're not preparing ourselves 
or that huge kidnap is going to become we reach there will be water but there will be less water at times that we do not expect it and therefore we have to collect it in time we must be ready this is just a nice picture from Nepal these two ladies sitting there next to the pond but the pond is larger during the rainy season you can see that this is just the bit that is there during the dry season is this you rainwater harvesting no it's not at all you. You all have been doing it at home when you were in the village or staying with your grandparents or whatever. Because when the rains come, everybody goes out and puts pails and pots and pans. But of course, that is only a little bit. There's much more you can do. And this is what has been done, has been done over the last many years. In uh, East Africa, the South, uh, Southern and Eastern Africa Regional Network was in existence, is still in existence. How active it is, is a bit difficult to say. In, as in many instances, things are going up and down. So it is a matter of having enthusiastic people, people who are competent, interested, and so on and so on to push these things. It works, but it mostly works for NGOs. Can I ask somebody to bring me some water? It's getting very dry in the mouth. Um, so it mostly works for uh, through NGOs, and that is not adequate. It's not adequate in the sense not because they're not good enough, but the point is that you know governments have to pick it up because they can provide policy and uh, guidance and regulation. And not only that, we are often facing difficulties in sustaining the investment because of lack of financing. Now, good enough, we have ever more private sector and consultants. Yes, you see everywhere here in town also a lot of plastic tanks. That is very helpful. But it's still offering systems to the relative elite, the middle classes. How far are we able to reach out to the rural areas? Not sufficiently. More work needs to be done. University consultants, my good friend, uh, has been studying her PhD on rainwater harvesting in Korea. Now, of course, the issue is to get it applied here in Tanzania in East Africa, become a research hub as a water institute. So we still face limited expansion. And that is a problem. We need to act. There are actions. Deep wet farming, as I said, is a policy concern of the government of Malawi. Uh, there are agencies that have been meta meta that have been implementing Swanstown in Nakuru, green roads for water, collecting water from floods, and so on and so on. Now we need to learn from that and then have the guts to apply it further. We have the means. We have many more uh, remote sensing, uh, artificial intelligence, whatever means in which we can see where applications are sensible. And then talk to the people to see where we can further water security and reduce harmful uh, events. Now, this is an example somewhere between agriculture and water supply for people and cattle. In, in this case, Ethiopia, Sandan, there are many in, in Kitui, in uh, this part of the world, in Kitui, in Kenya, uh, collecting uh, sand and water behind this little dam, which, only, which not only provides the cattle and people water for their domestic use, but also is going to green the embankments and even further. It really makes a difference to the whole environment in which this particular center is there. Now, let me talk about uh, the bit that, of course, is a bit closer to my heart because I'm saying green water harvesting alliance. I'm much more domestic. I'm not an agricultural engineer, I'm a sanitary engineer. So I'm in the business of providing people with water, good water. And that water can be collected in a lot of areas uh, through rain for the home, for school, for hospital. And of course, people say, ah, quality, 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 quality. It is the best quality if it is not set, if it is not compared to centrally treated water. It is of very good quality. And if you don't trust it, you can still use it for cleaning and flushing, which means it's going to save you a lot in terms of the cost and, and convenience. This nice gentleman from the parliament. Huh? Yes. 
Okay, that's okay. Yeah, uh, this nice gentleman from the uh, from the uh, Uganda Parliament is putting forward a bill in October last, saying that everybody should have a rainwater harvesting system in their home. It's like Belgium. Belgium has also done that. Can you switch off that sound there? Belgium has also done that. There is no new establishment in Belgium. Why? Makes sense. It saves the country, it saves everybody water. So this gentleman is pushing that. Of course, pushing it is one thing. And so we're saving water. Now you can see here we have uh, in this particular picture. We're trying to establish the picture come to do. We're trying to establish an era. We're looking at the readiness that countries have with respect to adopting rainwater harvesting. And so this one is based on assessment of uh, four criteria, the rainfall variation that you have, vulnerability in particular countries, the actors that are available in the country, and the policies that you have. And based on that, we see that we see that you know the countries in East Africa are doing relatively well, as well as some in West Africa. But there are still large areas where there is insufficient action, insufficient actual application. And that is a pity, because even in wet countries like Congo, we cannot afford to waste the water. We have to do something about it. So rainwater harvesting is not just important, it's also essential if we want to realize SDG 6 in its general terms, and in particular also the SDG 6.1 in real terms. This is a picture of the joint monitoring program of UNICEF based on data provided by your governments, uh, which shows the levels of uh, availability of proper water supply in particular countries, national and rural. And you find that most countries barely manage 50% proper rainwater, and then maybe there's some limited rainwater, let's say, that you get to about 80% at best. But if that is the case, then what are you going to do for the last 21% that is there for the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa? You will not be able to provide it through centralized water supply systems. You will not be able to provide it through hand pumps and boreholes. Yes, if you're in Dubai, you can because you have sufficient money. We don't have that money. We cannot. It's technically possible, but it is physically and for sustainability not an option. So therefore, we have to do something else. We have to look for opportunities to make sure that we use the rainwater that we have. What does it mean? It means, amongst others, that governments and agencies, everybody, will have to promote rainwater harvesting as a suitable solution. Even if you do not drink it, you can use it around the house. It will be very useful. Conserve and save water. And then, of course, governments and others, uh, private sector as well, we need to look at domestic and, and homestead harvesting, rainwater harvesting systems. Storing of rainwater, ponds, lakes, managed aquifer recharge, all these type of things are there because rainwater is essential to uh, integrated water resource management. And we have somehow not forgotten, but we have not taken sufficient action to do something with it. We only think big, but you also have to think small. The experience of India is that all the small efforts are worth more than all the big dams that they have been constructing. So, good use of rain will make the difference because we simply cannot afford to waste. Ah, money. The keynote speaker will say something about water and pipes. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but money is a problem because we do not have subsidies. Now I'm going to make a political statement. In the West, in my country, we subsidize a lot of conservation efforts and climate change related efforts. But when we are giving money to your countries, we say, no, 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 people have to pay for it themselves. It's not fair. 
kind of state. So why do you collect rainwater harvesting? Here in Tanzania, uh, Tanzania, you have, of course, a lot of areas where there is no water anyway. Then you have the problem of fluoride. If you have fluoride in the groundwater, better drink rainwater. Uh, we have serious problems in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, with our setting, and so on and so on. Rainwater is, is a good solution when you want to drink water and when you need it for cooking. Make sure that you cook water, cook the rice with clean water because the rice absorbs a lot of the chemicals. And of course, then the service, I mentioned that already. Uh, in urban and rural areas, you will have a lot, a lot better services. In the West, gradually, the issue of water charges, like in, in uh, Australia, they have been working on that, that they see that people who have rainwater harvesting systems really make a lot of money, means to say they spend less money on water, offering more convenience. Is it safe to drink? Yes, you know, they have so many means, and they're also there in your market, where you can either purchase, or you can learn from NGOs how to save, how to treat your water. Simple, household level, not a big deal. All kinds of information is here. Not only that, now I'm going to make a promotion again. In a few days' time, the WHO will be um, launching a document on sanitary inspection packages and on guidelines for drinking water quality for small water supplies. It has taken a little bit of time, but it also has an extensive section on rainwater harvesting. So, my last slide, I think we should uh, invest more in promoting the buffering of water in the landscape, make sure that we have more water available for the household and the community. That means that we have to work on it ourselves. Is that possible? Yes. There's a lot of things you can do yourself. You do not have to wait for others. Of course, it is nice if you can get some small subsidy, a little bit of assistance that is there. We have to work with our governments, with the banks, but it also becomes possible for people to take small loans for rainwater harvesting for getting a system in their own home. We at IRHA, we have calculated that six to eight percent of the world population can only be served by rainwater. And sometimes even more. Ten percent of the population in Australia uses rainwater exclusively. Australia, yes, Australia. So it's not a norm. But we think that overall, six to eight percent requires rainwater. Let's invest in it. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to manage the yeah, closing the gap with six point one. In order to achieve all that, follow the example of our friends in Malawi. Organize something. Happy rain day. It's not only bad. And then, if you want to have a sticker like the one there, I'll have some for you. This is my vision for the future. This is rainwater tanks in the mountains, 2,500 meters up in Nepal. It's a nice picture, and it could be ours too. Thank you. Really very safe. Uh, as a uh, retired dog, I have to say that you have to treat it. But I've, in many instances, drink it, been drinking it without treatment, and it is not an issue. Um, but, of course, it could. But there are no epidemiological, there's hardly any epidemiological evidence that it is not work, that it is not good. With respect to minerals, Again, WHO says that minerals should not come from water, they should come from food. So diverse food is your saving, not the question that it is that the rainwater is not having so many minerals. But that is, whereas uh, with respect to different places in, Afri in uh, Tanzania where you can use rainwater, that all depends on further study and so on. There are plenty of places, I mean, there are so many experiences uh, that you already have in Tanzania. It's just a matter of lifting it to a higher level, convincing district authorities, convincing others that there is uh, a, more, a greater need for investment in this area. Yeah, Santa Sana kwa majibu ayo. Kwa kiswahili, nita summarize kidogo tu swali na majibu. Mwanzetu waliuliza swali kwamba maji ya mvua ya nafaa kunyueka pasipo kuchemshwa. 
Kwa hiyo mtaalamu ameeleza kwamba yanaweza kanyoka lakini amerecommend kwamba ni vizuri uhakikisha kwamba yanachemshwa pale inapowezekana na issue za minerals anategemea kwamba minerals utazipata kutoka kwenye vyakula kwa hiyo maji ya mvua usitegemee kupata minerals kutoka kwenye maji ya mvua kwa kwa sababu ya muda tutakaribisha maswali mengine mawili na presentation nyingine karibuni mtu mwenye swali nionyeshe mkono ili aweze kufikisha online Thank you. Um, as we wait for questions from the audience, we also have questions from the Zoom, where our colleagues also from various places are joining in the EWA platform. So you may also respond to those. Somebody is asking what are good business cases around rainwater harvesting? What examples can be invested in by private sector? Um, here in uh, East Africa, of course, you have uh, Companies like Shirtliff and Davis that have been uh, providing a lot of water resource, water uh, related uh, uh, materials and, and equipment. They also do a lot in rainwater harvesting. Um, the business case remains a bit difficult simply because of the gap between the cost of the system and the financial uh, availability on the part of the household. And of course, the question that one can raise also is if you put in a centralized system, how much does that cost? How much does that subsidize the user? Quite a bit. And why are, not, why are we not also looking at subsidizing it for the households? We have done, uh, when I was younger, I did a large World Bank program in Sri Lanka in which we uh, constructed some few thousand of these uh, rainwater tanks with a subsidy and it worked very well. Currently, they have over 50,000 not subsidized. So it is a matter of starting and then getting it going. But the, the easy business cases are not so, uh, they're not so forthcoming. Technologies of rainwater harvesting in situ. There is, that's a gentleman uh, from uh, Ubaidur Rahman. Um, the FAO in uh, FAO MENA, the uh, uh, North African uh, organization, the North African part of that organization, has been organizing a range of uh, seminars, webinars last year. And there is a lot of very interesting stuff available. I can send you the uh, references. You can contact them and you can download a lot of information on the uh, dry lands that you also have in Pakistan and that they were then discussing on the uh, uh, Maghreb area. Ethiopia has a good red annual rainfall, yes, but rainfall is only there for three months, nine months of dry spell. That is true. Now the question is, if I'm a woman and I don't have rainwater harvesting, it means that for nine months of the year, I have to carry water from very far. If I have rainwater harvesting, the experience from around the world is that people are able, women in particular, are able to stretch the water for at least some six months. And so it means for nine months of the year, you don't have to rush out to give your husband a cup of tea at five o'clock in the morning. Does it make a difference? Yes. So it's also a matter of thinking, who is going to benefit? One more question before we move to the next presentation. Karim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is going to the. My name is Alex Julius Logan from the My question is going to the first question where she asked me what the safety of the Rainwater. Now I'm asking that there are sometimes there is a case of acidic rain. Uh, now the question is how can you identify the rains are uh, risk of uh, acidic rain? We don't have to say uh, the rainwater. Uh, the second question is how can you treat the water with acidic content? Best thing is to start a ferrous tank. 
which you automatically <laughs> resolve the problem. Actually, the acidic rain is only a limited problem. Uh, there are areas where indeed acidic rain has occurred. Of course, it is nowadays less because the world is gradually becoming more aware of uh, air pollution uh, issues. And of course, there are still a lot of uh, coal-fired uh, energy uh, uh, areas in, in India. And that's still giving us a little bit of acidic, uh, uh, acidic rainfall. But it is a, a lesser problem. If you uh, use a ferro cement tank, then of course the ferro cement takes care of that a little bit. It makes it a little bit. Thank you, engineer. I think because of uh, time limitation, we proceed to the next presentation. And uh, because engineer will be around, so we can get in touch in later time for further detailed discussion on one to one. Yeah, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Alfred Obiko. I'm Thank you very much. My name is Alfred Tupiko from Kenya. Working in a successful clean water health village. On the first of all, I want to say that Dr. Tulinave and the protocol observe. Good morning. Uh, because of the time limited. Uh, the Calabash system is a very special and a very very easy way to collect rain water or the, the way to collect the rain water the Calabash system is very easy in the picture in you, when you see on your screen that is Rifamara That is if uh, Mara, I think it grows from, it starts from Mao Forest complex. That is a reserve tower, and it goes across Kenya to Tanzania, Serengeti. And the river, it has got very many problems. The people can drink water there, but there are a lot of animals there, crocodiles, and the water itself is not so good for human consumption and uh, the calabash also is good because the usually we do a 5000 liter in most cases this this webinar is in four concepts that is the origin of the clean water that's the calabash we have the capacity to do the sharing and training, promoting rainwater wasting and storage. For example, in our county, that is in Kenya, International Exchange and Conference Building. In this case, the, the cradle of the Calabash started in Guinea Bissau, some way back 2008, through a Dutchman by the name Paul Ackerman. We have developed the system. You see, in Africa, the, the problem of collecting rainwater is what, what do you, where do you invest or where do you store that water? In most cases, when buying these PVC systems or the tanks, the plastic ones, they are mostly more expensive to buy, to install, but the calabash it's very easy. In one thing is that it can be constructed by the local masons. The materials are there. So you will not be taking a lot of work to collect the rain. That's an example of the calabash system in Guinea Bissau. Thanks for the polar common a Dutch who invented the calabash system. On the other hand, the Clean Water Health Village have started in the, this modern way of collecting water through the Calabash system. In 2014, we have a 
a training facility. So we have two training facilities for the Calabash system. That is in Guinea-Bissau and the one in Kenya. It is along the eastern, east, west, eastern, west, eastern part of Kenya. That's along almost to the border of Kenya and Tanzania. We have our manuals on the website, you can get it. This is clean. You can start in the website www.cleanwaterhealthvillage.com. That's where you can go to the manuals. The construction of this one takes six days to get ready for the use of it. That is the, we have been doing trainings. That is the extending capacity through the sharing and, and training. We have had a training in Malawi, that is 2022, 2020, in, in an organization called, I don't remember it, the name, but it is in Malawi, Blanta, Zomba, Zomba, it's in Zomba. We have also a training in, in Tanzania, Serengeti, we train Masons there. We are called by the member of parliament of Serengeti, Dr. Amsabi. That training we did it in on December 2022. Also, an example of the Calabar system we have a 10,000 system in, done by an organization in Madagascar called Tatian, they have installed a system of 10,000 liters in an hospital. So that is quite a commendable job. On the, on the other hand, we have the, we have usually when we got a request on the construction of this system. We have three teams, of each team have a, a team leader or a trainer. In, in recent parts for four years, we have installed the Rian Calabar systems in Kenya, in the Masai or in the North County, and 50 other in the other parts of Kenya. Uh, the system, as you can see in the pictures, that is the foundation of the system. You can just probably, if you don't have the, the cement blocks, you can use the matofali. Nasa to me matofali. Matofali in Karibu Miyatatu Amzini. That is the process. It will take only six days to get ready. And you make it wet for another one week. Then you start collecting your water. Uh, in Kenya, in, we had a, a women, you know, the, the, the water, the, the, the very good thing about water. In Africa, women are the, the one responsible for water collection. When, when, you empower, when you empower the women to be the one collecting water, I mean the women are the one to collect water, but the men just to the, maybe to do some other things. But mostly water is important to get responsible from the women because they are the one who collect. They have a lot of work to do. And in that case, we have developed a, a joint group for women. They are called a group to a women group. They are self-help group. They, we, we train them. So now they can do their own, they can construct Calabar system on their own. So they are the one who knows the importance of what and swimming. There you can see the lady, Calabar system. And uh, the, on the, on the far picture on the right, is the system. On the, right, on the left hand, 
is the construction going on, that is the start of the calabash for the first day. And in recently we are making a, a program to have one chaining in Rwanda. So in the pictures there, that's a calabash system in a school where children are taking water. In the training, usually, the, the, when we do a training for the new muscles, usually we do it in two, two weeks. The first week is for the instructor to show the, the system how it will be done, and the second week is the trainees to get to show what they learn. In the picture here, you can see the garbage with uh, the roof is not connected. Sometimes when it rains, because in Africa, sometimes when it rains, when you when you let, when you left your gunners just connected when there is no rain, there are a lot of waste on the top of the roof. That's why when there is no rain, you disconnect it to make it good. When it rains for the first time, the first flash, because we are not developed so much that you have the first flash, you just cut the gutters and then you disconnect. Thank you very much. That's the much you can see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Teboko. Uh, we welcome for a discussion, few questions, but also because Mr. Teboko will still be around, we can meet on one to one and uh, keep on continuing our discussion on the subject we have been presenting on. So you're welcome for one, two, maximum three questions, and then we we'll proceed. You can raise your hand, then I shall bring the mic. There's a question from the, the webinar platform, the Zoom platform. They're asking, have you ever calculated how long they can use the collected rainwater after installing a calabash system? Thank you very much. Mostly, maybe for example, the 5,000 liters is when you have 10 people for, for a household. Probably, if they give one person to use five liters of water per day, that is probably 90 to 100 days. That's a, I did an example of 10 people in the house or in the household. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Why there is no data about rainwater harvesting application in Somalia? But also, would like to take question from the audience. Just raise your hand. Okay, thank you. We are all most welcome to continue our discussion with our presenters. After this session, they will still be around, so we can meet them up for further discussion, specific questions. And uh, as for now, we thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the presenters as well. Thank you very much to our participants from the Zoom platform from various countries as well. Thank you. We'll be sharing the presentation through the channels of IWA. Thank you very much.